Welcome back to our study of the book of 1 Kings. We are in 1 Kings chapter 8, looking at verses 54 to 61. This is Solomon's blessing to the people of Israel at the end of, or toward the end of, the dedication of the temple. Remember, so many people had come to Jerusalem for the Feast of Booths, and uh, as a part of that, Solomon was dedicating the temple that he had finished building as a, a house for the Lord, where the Lord put his name there, and he just prayed um, for the Lord to have his eyes toward the temple, so that when any anytime anybody, um, Israelite or foreigner, prayed toward the temple, um, or came to the temple um, in prayer, that the Lord would hear their prayer and respond. And then he speaks a uh, blessing over the people of Israel, which is what We'll focus on this time, but notice first um, Solomon's posture of prayer. So this is a, a lengthy prayer in 1 Kings chapter 8 that we've looked at, and uh, one of the longest prayers in the Bible outside of uh, the Psalms themselves. And um, when Solomon began his prayer, back in verse 22, we are told Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel, and spread out his hands toward heaven. So he's standing before the altar at the temple, and he is spreading out his hands toward heaven. But by the time he gets to the end of the prayer, in verse 54, this is where we're picking it up today, in verse 54 it says, Now as Solomon finished offering all this prayer and plea to the Lord, he arose from before the altar of the Lord, where he had knelt with hands outstretched toward heaven. So his hands are still stretched out toward heaven, but now he is kneeling. By the end of his prayer, he's kneeling instead of standing. Now, I draw attention to this because most of us have heard uh, so much about the fact that we can pray anywhere at any time and there's no particular posture required that we overlook the fact that the Bible does encourage us, even though it doesn't require us, it encourages us to uh, follow certain postures of prayer. For example, 1 Timothy 1.8, Paul says to Timothy, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. So Paul wants people to pray, men in particular, to pray with their hands lifted up. Ephesians 3.14, Paul says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father. Now, again, that doesn't mean that every time you pray you have to physically bow your knees or that you have to raise your hands in the air or anything like that. But it does mean that if we never do those things, then um, maybe we should do those more often than we do, right? Maybe, um, maybe we have so emphasized the fact that the Bible uh, doesn't require certain postures uh, of prayer that we have forgotten that it does encourage some, and that we ought to heed those encouragements, right? So sometimes we should kneel if we're able. Sometimes we should lift our hands um, if we're able. So. Um, Note that from Solomon, right? Note the posture of his prayer, not only from Solomon, but also from Paul. Now, um, once he finishes praying to the Lord, then in verse 55, he blesses the people of Israel. It says, And he stood and blessed all the assembly of Israel with a loud voice, saying... Now, here's something I think that um, many of us have not thought about before. What is a blessing when you, when you bless somebody, when Solomon blesses the people here, what is he doing? What is taking place? Um, and what a blessing is, is it's essentially a prayer, but uh, this prayer, though its um, ultimate audience is God, it is directed toward a person or a group of people. So in most prayers, we're praying to the Lord. When we say, you, we're talking about God. God, would you do this? God, would you help me with this? God, would you respond to this? But when we speak a blessing, the you is directed at the person or the group of people, like in uh, the blessing that the priests in Israel were to speak. Uh, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, and so on from Numbers 
6, 24 to 26. So uh, a blessing is still intended to be heard by God and answered by God, but it is directed in, in the way we speak it, it's directed toward people. So a blessing is it's not magic words, right? It's not wishful thinking. It's a form of prayer, right? So as Solomon speaks this blessing to the people of Israel, it's essentially the same thing as saying, God, would you do these things that I'm, that I'm speaking um, over Israel, right? Um, it's, it's a way of, it's just a different form, a different way of, of saying the same thing where the, the audience, the person you're really praying for, um, they hear the words, directed at them, um, and God is overhearing, so to speak. But again, that's not accidental. It's intentional that God would hear these words and respond to them. So that, that's what a blessing is. It's a, it's a kind of prayer, right? If you bless your children at night, um, like we often do, say the Lord bless you and keep you, what are you doing? You're, you're saying, God, would you bless and keep this child? It's, it's a prayer. It's just worded um, differently than others, and, and that makes it a blessing. All right, so what does he say in this blessing? Verse 56, Blessed be the Lord, who has given rest to his people Israel, according to all that he promised. All right, so he blesses God, he praises God, he gives thanks to God, because God has given rest to the people of Israel. And as we've seen over and over again, this is a fulfillment of the promise that God made to David. When David wanted to build a house, he had recently um, begun to experience rest from his enemies, 2 Samuel 7 tells us. And as a part of the promise that God made to him in verses 10 and 11, God said to David, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more, as formerly, from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. So they're going to have rest in the land. God's going to plant them, establish them, give them rest from all their enemies. And Solomon says, the Lord has done that. Just like he promised, he has given us rest. So we bless him for that. And then he says, uh, second half of verse, verse 56, not one word has failed of all his good promise, which he spoke by Moses, his servant. So now he's going back to promises that uh, God made to Moses or, or gave to the people through Moses. And um, he's emphasizing that God has kept those promises, right? They're in the land now. Um, they have um, a centralized location of worship there at the temple in Jerusalem. It's like we saw before, uh, that's uh, fulfillment of Deuteronomy chapter 12. And uh, this emphasis on no word of God's having failed or fallen echoes the book of Joshua. Remember, uh, after Moses died, Joshua uh, was given the mantle of leadership of the nation of Israel. He's the one who led them into the promised land where they received uh, that promised inheritance that they've been waiting for since the days of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob through all their sojourn in Egypt and then into the wilderness time. And uh, they saw the fulfillment of God's promise in the days of Joshua. And so Joshua said, Now I am about to go the way of all the earth, so he was about to die, and you know in your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. That's Joshua 23, 14. So uh, what Solomon is saying is the same thing that Joshua was saying, and that's intentional, uh, that Solomon's echoing Joshua and saying, you know, just like God kept his promises in the days of Joshua, so God has kept his promises in our day as well. He has done just what he said. The length of time between us and Moses has not caused God to forget or to fail to do what he said he would do. And then uh, verse 57, uh, he says, The Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us or forsake us. So again, this is a a prayer. It's spoken over the people. It's talking about us. May the Lord do this for us. It's not directed to God, but it is intended for God to hear and answer. 
right? So uh, the Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us or forsake us. Um, this also reminds us of something from the books of Moses in the book of Exodus. Remember that Israel sinned with the golden calf while Moses was up on the mountain. And uh, so they had broken covenant with the Lord. They'd um, broken the commandments uh, not to worship idols. And uh, so God said to them in Exodus 33, 3, Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. So God said, I'll give you the promised land, but I'm not going. And the people, of course, um, were devastated by that word, right? And later in verse 12 of Exodus 33, Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. So you're telling me to, to take this people into the promised land, but, but who's going to go with me? So the Lord responds in verse 14, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. That's what Moses wanted. Um, and if you read the whole chapter, you can see there, uh, Moses says essentially, God, if you don't go with us, what makes us different from anybody else? We need you with us. And so God, uh, God does promise to go with them, to be present with them. Um, and of course, in the book of Hebrews, one of my favorite promises in the Bible, Hebrews 13, 5, um, says that he will never leave us or forsake us. And so that's what Solomon is, is praying. Now that God has come to dwell in the temple as he dwelt in the tabernacle, he's saying, Lord, never leave us. Be with us like you're with Moses. Be with us like you're with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Be with us like you're with David, my father. Be with us and don't leave us. And what does he want God to do among them? Verse 58, that he may incline our hearts to him to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes and his rules, which he commanded our fathers. So um, we know the Bible is very clear. You see this in Joshua 1, 8. You see this in Psalm 1, um, that blessing comes to those who meditate on the word and who do the word. And Solomon is acknowledging we're not going to live according to God's word unless God dwells with us. If God leaves us, we will leave the path. We will leave behind the commandments. We will go our own way. We need God to be with us in order to help us do the things uh, that God has called us to do. And then that's true for us still today. One of the reasons why the Holy Spirit dwells in us is to enable us and empower us to do the things that God has called us to do. That's why we're called to be filled with the Spirit, to keep in step with the Spirit, to walk according to the Spirit. Because if we walk in accord with the Spirit, we won't gratify the desires of the flesh. And if we walk according to the Spirit, we walk in love. And if we love, we fulfill the law. So uh, we need God with us. Solomon prays for that for the people. And then verse 59, he says, Let these words of mine, which I have pleaded before the Lord, be near to the Lord our God day and night, and may he maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people, Israel, as each day requires. Right? So he says, um, this is a one-time prayer, but God, let these words be near to you all the time, that you would always be responding to this prayer, always answering these things that we have asked for you to answer today, because we need you, right? Again, that he may maintain the cause of his servant and cause uh, and the cause of his people, Israel, as each day requires. We're going to need you every day. Right? So he prays for the Lord to hear um, and to help. And then verse 60, he says, That all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God, there is no other. Part of what is at stake in what happens with Israel is God's reputation in the world. God has attached his name to the nation of Israel, and what he does among them is part of how he shows to the rest of the world that he's the one true and living God. And so Solomon is saying, work in us, be among us, work on our behalf, not just because, you know, we want to be protected and we want to be provided for it and we want to be blessed and so on, but also because we want all the world to know about you. We want your name and your fame to spread all throughout the world. This is what God was doing in the Exodus, 
right? In Exodus 9, 16, God uh, tells Pharaoh, this is why I raised you up, that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Right? And, and his fame did spread beyond Egypt uh, as people heard about what God had done through the Hebrews and for the Hebrews. And so Solomon's saying, continue to do that. Make your name known through what you do uh, for us. Uh, and then the last verse, verse 61, he says, Let your heart therefore be wholly true to the Lord our God, walking in his statutes and keeping his commandments as at this day. So now he's calling upon the people of Israel themselves, and he's saying, Let your heart be wholly true to the Lord, walking in his statutes, keeping his commandments. So let every day, as you are doing today, let every day, let your heart be totally uh, given toward and committed to obeying the Lord, honoring the Lord, walking in his ways. In other words, keep the Shema, right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, right? Do that, Solomon is calling them uh, to do, encouraging them to do in this blessing. So uh, his blessing to them is really a prayer for them that God would be with them, that God would help them, that God would hear his prayer, that God would make himself known through the nation of Israel. Uh, it's acknowledging what God has already done, that he has given them rest, that he has kept his promises, that all he has said that he will do, um, he has in fact been doing, he has kept his word. And when, we're, when we are reminded how faithful God has been to us, then that encourages us to be faithful to him, which is where Solomon ends our prayer, or ends his prayer, his blessing, and uh, is a good place for us to end as well. Remember what the Lord has done for you. Remember how faithful the Lord has been that you might be faithful, be encouraged to be faithful and spurred on to greater faithfulness in your walk with Jesus. Amen.